due to its size, comparative economic might, and historical and cultural relevance to South Asia, India has enjoyed substantial influence across the region. How will India continue to manage its influence in South Asia in the face of protectionist policies and political tensions? As China steps up its engagement and promotes Asian connectivity largely through its Belt and Road vision, its influence in South Asia is growing rapidly. What part is China playing in the discourse on nation building in South Asia? In addition to China's extensive economic relationship with South Asian nations, the Chinese Navy also contributes to regional peace and stability. Is the Chinese fleet challenging the military status quo in South Asia as some in the international community are concerned? In what ways could South Asian countries enhance mutual trust at the military level? In recent years, the Chinese Navy has conducted an escort mission in the Gulf of Aden, evacuated Chinese nationals from Libya, conducted anti-piracy operations, and escorted the maritime transportation of chemical weapons from Syria. In what further ways can China continue to contribute to maritime freedom and security? And what types of international cooperation should be undertaken? China is the second biggest economy whilst India, the fastest developing economy on this planet today. Engagements between these two major powers are bringing a growing number of headlines on media coverage. India has been managing its influence and leadership in this region for decades. But with the growing links between China and the South Asian states, challenges now start jumping out one after another. Will competition and the confrontation between these two countries be the main melody in this part of Asia? What are the opportunities and challenges faced by South Asian nations? To unpack the stories in this area, I'm happy to be joined today by Mr. Jayadeva Ranade, member of the National Security Advisory Board and president of the Center for China Analysis and Strategy in India, and Mr. Songzhi Hui, vice dean of School of International Studies at Sichuan University. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. Pleasure. I have many questions about South Asia, which is described by many Chinese observers as your backyard. My question would rather focus on the geopolitical ambition and tradition of a country which prefers to be a fan of a non-aligned movement, ironically. So what do you think of uh, the true thinking of Prime Minister Modi in the post-Cold War era when China really wants to be friend of everybody, including India, and yet we meet a very strong position because of uh, also the issue of nationalism, right? I think what we are seeing is um, a growth of nationalism everywhere, uh, in India, in China, around the world, in many countries. But if we bring it down to this region, I would say that um, we are seeing in India a Prime Minister who has articulated a vision for India. Uh, economics is at the center of that vision as far as uh, Prime Minister Modi is concerned. And he wants to, in fact, accelerate the process of development in India. Uh, in the process, he also feels that uh, if he can expand the market, and if he can integrate uh, the economies of the region, uh, it would help promote economic betterment. That is the word I would use. I think with China also we are seeing the same thing. There is a very pronounced modernization effort which has been going on for many years before ours started. And uh, that is being accelerated, certainly has been in the last five years. There has been, an, I would say, greater push to expand outwards, uh, to get uh, a bigger market. And that is where there could be enhanced competition and what we are seeing uh, happen in the region. There is a strong counter-argument. On the one hand, uh, India wants to push its national interest uh, through geopolitical links, using enormous influence on Sri Lanka and Nepal, but without giving serious regard to the economic integration. On the other hand, it really wants to go east with more Chinese investment, Japanese investment in the construction of a high-speed railway, for example, and infrastructure. So their policy does not sound as uh, economical as what Mr. Renardi says. What's your, what's your take? 
Okay, that I, I understand uh, the, the Modi government uh, uh, start, studied that uh, the, uh, act in China. First was the looking east, and now with their act, act east right now. And I this think this is quite in line with China's you know, uh, efforts to, to start at the BCI and uh, Bangladesh, India, China, Myanmar, this is an economic corridor, which uh, our Premier Li Keqiang you know, initiated with uh, the former your former Prime Minister Ma Singh in 2013. I think it's something very good, not only for the two countries, you know, but for the region. Here, like, like I mentioned, that Myanmar and uh, Bangladesh, this is the place that we, as our two, you know, in China, India, should you know, work on that. This is the area that you know, should not be, uh, should, you know, we should do more on this. And that, that eventually, that will bring you know, a lot of benefits to the to the countries. We need to cooperate. And this is apparently a part of our OBR plan of road initiative. Uh, we have lots to do on, on this. However, one major obstacle that gets in the way of our uh, establishing the presence through Belt and Road Initiative is Kashmir and India makes no secret about their anger. Um, they say uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor will go through Kashmir, which is uh, your, allegedly your territory. So uh, India refused to participate in the uh, Belt and Road Summit in Beijing. That surprised many of the Chinese uh, who pin hopes on the performance and uh, uh, brilliant contributions of Prime Minister Modi. What do you think of uh, the future of uh, economic integration between China and the India? Uh, in the context of South Asia, because we cannot bypass South Asia, neither could we bypass the Indian Ocean, which once again is taken by some of the nationalist media in your country as the backyard and with, with zero tolerance for China's military presence there. Well, you rolled two questions into one. Let me just talk about this Belt and Road Initiative which you referred to. Uh, I think there are two issues here. The first is the Belt and Road Initiative itself. Um, India's opposition has not been to the concept. We are saying that uh, when you thought of the One Belt, One Road, as it was called earlier, uh, what was its design, what was its objective? Uh, in India, we are not clear of what exactly is meant. So I think uh, there is room for discussion there. Uh, if we sit down and talk about how it can benefit us, what the plans are, possibly we will find some meeting ground. I'm not saying we will, but we possibly can. As far as the China-Pakistan economic corridor is concerned, that is a problem. Uh, it is a project which China announced. Um, of course, there are various figures on the value of the project. But as you pointed out, it goes through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, it goes through Gilgit, it goes through Baltistan, where India has had sovereign territorial claims right from the beginning. China itself accepted the claims and in fact uh, China has maintained I would say a policy of ambiguity on the status of these areas over the years. Uh, initially it also said that as and when the issue is resolved it will discuss it with the, cons with the concerned country. That seems to have changed with the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And uh, China has now uh, put its money where its mouth is, if I may say, and gone in uh, with the project. It has also led to consequences uh, which impinge on us, which impinge on our sovereignty in the sense that Pakistan is now trying to change, uh, going against the past practice. It's trying to integrate Gilgit and Baltistan more into the Pakistani Federation thereby changing de facto the borders of the ground. So these are the consequences of uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is why there is Indian opposition. Uh, how it can be resolved, what can be done, I don't know. We'll have to uh, think about it. But certainly there are also military connotations there. So these are the factors that come in uh, onto this. Why? Do we still have the issue of a mistrust between New Delhi and Beijing? Is that also because of history? The history about the 1962 border class, the Dalai Lama, uh, Pakistan, Kashmir. Uh, do you think these obstacles would uh, stand there forever and prevent the two 
major economies from uh, getting further integrated? And do you think uh, that will prevent China from uh, moving into the market in South Asia? I, I think that there is a mistrust between China and India. It's of course it both because of the history and uh, the present situation here now. But the politicians uh, talk smart about uh, mutual trust. 99.9% uh, .9 of the history, we didn't have any problems. Uh, not a single bullet has been fired since 1962 across the border. Uh, troops uh, were just pushing each other rudely. They didn't use a live ammunition. I mean, basically, the two countries don't fight each other. They, they don't want to fight each other. And yet, the mistrust still exists there. Why? You're right, you know, because, you know, if you look, look at the history earlier before that, we had a very, we call the honeymoon decade, you know, between China and India. We say that the indigenous pai pai, right, you know? Mm -hmm. And now uh, here, that, that was, that happened in the Cold War. You know, in the Cold War, there are some outside reasons for that, you know. So when the, the Americans, you know, and the Soviets in the 1960s, so there are some outside political reasons, geopolitical reasons that had, created the problem between China and India. So this is from the history uh, perspective. But if you look at the current situation here, you know, I think maybe, uh, I actually not think that uh, the current Indian leaders inherited from that, but, but at the fact is that, uh, yeah, as, as far as my understanding that uh, in India, there are many people who are still, you know, viewing China as a threat. So of course, this is, uh, we, we have the shadow from the history and uh, in fact, I, I should say again that uh, the Chinese government, you know, uh, has shown this uh, sincerity to make friends with uh, as all the countries, you know, neighboring countries, including India. And uh, yes, I will say again that uh, Mr. Kulkani, two days ago, he had, you know, he was giving a lecture. He, uh, in, on the last day, he put his lecture on that, uh, can India and China be friends? Question mark. And uh, he said that, yes. If we had a very you know, long history in, uh, in harmony, we have been cooperating, especially in the 50, 1950s. And uh, today, when we are you know, pushing our number one, our aim, our you know, objective is you know, still you know, to uh, make friends and to, uh, to bring mutual benefit to all the related countries. So we sincerely hope that India uh, can work with us on that, and that's why I mentioned that we have the PCIM, and uh, here once again that the CPAC, China and Pakistan have been covered. So this is uh, uh, our intention to bring, you know, to benefit all. Right. We have many mechanisms and platforms uh, to bring leaders from both countries together. For example, the Shanghai Corporation Organization, BRICS, uh, you name it. And the leaders could meet on the sidelines of many multilateral meetings. Do you think uh, uh, gradually through the uh, platform of a geoeconomics, forget about the geopolitical rivalry, the two countries uh, would come closer uh, and enjoy the benefits of co-prosperity? This is basically the essence of the Belt and Road Initiative. We don't use a zero-sum game of the Cold War any longer. I quite agree with you, but as I said, um, the fact we had mentioned earlier about the possibility of the two leaders meeting on the sidelines, as you said, of the APEC and all that. And my response was that the oftener they meet, uh, if the frequency goes up, it's a good thing. It is one of the ways in which trust can be addressed. And I think At that least to diffuse the crisis. To diffuse. Well, and that, that is the key thing. I mean, if there is a certain degree of trust, then uh, tensions don't mount that rapidly. That is what I would say. It is also a fact that we have two if I may use the term strong leaders today in China and in India, uh, leaders who have a reputation for being decisive and uh, they are therefore well placed to take initiatives uh, in order to address this issue of trust. So I think what you said about geoeconomics really being a platform which can help develop the relationship, I agree with that. I think it is a uh, good platform. Uh, it is a platform which provides for cooperation in sectors where both need that uh, assistance from each other and it should happen. But again I come back to this thing that uh, for that we do need a step-by-step -step approach and once the leaderships have taken a position, I think the bureaucracies will follow. This is how I would look at it. 
You are watching dialogue with Mr. Jadev Ranade, former member of the National Security Advisory Board, president of the Center for China Analysis and Strategy. Uh, joining us uh, as well is uh, Professor Song Zhi Hui, Vice Dean of the School of International Studies, Sichuan University. We've been discussing geopolitical situation in South Asia and the bilateral relationship between India and China. As a result, stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back, gentlemen. We have uh, built the first overseas military base in Djibouti. Uh, in the context of the Pearl Theory along the coastline of the Indian Ocean, as the Indian media put it, this is a, a war game. This, uh, this goes against the national interests of India. But the Chinese will just uh, uh, talk about this dismissively. We don't take your uh, your concerns very seriously. We have growing global stakes that need to be protected by the Navy, uh, by our military build-up. I'm afraid our Indian friends cannot understand the Chinese uh, concerns and the, legit the legitimate concerns in this regard. Uh, what's your take? I think um, it's a bit unfair to say that uh, the Indian, um, uh, Indian side doesn't take the concerns very seriously. I think uh, they are aware that China has expanding interests. They have workers in various places. They have projects in various places. So certainly, um, they need a capability to look after those interests. Uh, and we don't trust the American Navy. You don't trust the American Navy. That's true. Uh, neither do we feel that uh, policing, if I may use the term, the Indian Ocean is our job. Uh, as long as the Indian Ocean is safe, as long as the cargo and the passengers who uh, traverse that ocean are safe, uh, that's our concern. What I think is a matter where at least our defense experts and our naval experts uh, take cognizance of is the rapid pace of the development of the Chinese Navy. So naturally when that happens, they factor in the projected size of the Navy with what they assess to be the requirements of the Navy and then uh, there is concern expressed. So either it will be expressed in the form of the Indian Navy uh, expanding or modernizing or it will be a question of trying to uh, address the matter in some other ways. And uh, I don't look at it as uh, a uh, competition of matching uh, ship by ship but certainly it's a question of matching mutual interests. I appreciate your, uh, uh, your positive and encouraging analysis about the security scenario in, in the Indian Ocean. There won't be necessarily a open confrontation between the two navies. By the way, three major fleets of China uh, are deployed elsewhere, not in the Indian Ocean. That somehow showcases China's confidence and sense of security uh, in this area. But it is exactly our uh, sense of relief that is a puzzle to people like me. Why should a joint naval exercise uh, uh, took place uh, between India, Japan, and uh, uh, the United States, its code name uh, Malabar? Uh, it, it seems to target China. And uh, whenever our uh, submarine appears uh, allegedly in the Indian Ocean, there was immediately an uproar in the media fanfare uh, on the Indian side, uh, they would call, oh, the wolf is on the doorstep. So <laughs> China was taken aback by this kind of sensational headlines. Uh, what do you think of our uh, military presence in the Indian Ocean? Okay, you first you mentioned that, uh, that uh, we called it, we, we should not say that the Japanese is on a military basis. It's different from that of the U.S. and other countries in the overseas military basis. It is our you know, logistic support base, okay, it's a base, but uh, logistic, you know, so we, because we have that uh, uh, Navy's escorting the ships here in the Yadin Sea, right? The Sea of Yadin. And uh, so this is different, one thing. And the, you, you mentioned about that, uh, the, the exercise, the drills in, in, the, in the Malabar drill in, in the Noshi. I think there are, there's uh, some outside reasons, you know, from the U.S., from the Japan, and even from Australia. I noticed that uh, the Americans, they have their you know, their, uh, their way to do that, you know, with the Japan and uh, just to try to uh, uh, attract India to work with them. Uh, this is a part of the Americans which return to Asia or people to Asia strategies, you know, although it was that, that uh, Obama administration is, is uh, 
uh, it's, it's a strategy. But now, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the Donald Trump administration is still doing, maybe they change their name, but uh, I think this is in line with uh, uh, India. Uh, so I think, of course, definitely it was because Americans. I, I think India is the leader of the non-line movement. I don't think the India will, you know, um, join with the, the Western, especially the U.S., to, to contain China. Now, let's look at the Prime Minister Modi. To what degree do you think he has changed the dynamics of your foreign policy? On a strategic level, he has changed. From the time of his swearing in, in fact, he has outlined the perimeters of the areas of strategic influence that India hopes uh, or has interest in. Uh, and you can just see that by the people whom he had invited. Uh, after that, the visits that he has undertaken to Kathmandu, Bhutan, etc. So that's one part of the uh, policy uh, outreach that he has done. The second are the overtures that he has made to China. Uh, I, I think that um, his economic interest was very clear, that India has huge needs, particularly in infrastructure, and he was hoping for Chinese investment and interest in that sector. And the third is, of course, that uh, we are uh, trying to consolidate, uh, Modi is trying to consolidate the relationships that we have with US, with Japan, etc., in order again for the technology, for the capital that these countries represent. So I don't think it's just a question of looking at it from a negative point of view. It is a question of what is in India's interest, which we are trying to seek. Uh, if I can just mention, that we were referring slightly earlier to the Navy, to the maritime domain. Uh, it has some relevance to this. Uh, instead of just looking at it as a Malabar, a Malabar exercise, which involves uh, the US, us, and Japan, um, the scope can be expanded. China can join. I mean, if not Malabar, we can have an India-China uh, Have you given the invitation itself. to China? Well, I don't know. That's the two governments who had to discuss, not me. <laughs> but I don't think that uh, from India there will be an, uh, any objection. In fact, there was a statement some time back saying that India and China can also look to uh, joint exercises. And why not? There are both, uh, they both got, uh, you know, navies which can exercise in these areas. So I think that's another way of looking at it. I, uh, we should not look at um, India's um, reaching out to these countries or trying to, if I may use the term, reinvigorate the relationship with these countries as uh, directed at each other. Of course, it opens the room for maneuver. It increases the room for maneuver. That is something all countries do in diplomacy. Perhaps we have overreacted to the diplomatic maneuvers undertaken by Prime Minister Modi since he took office because at least India has not yet got the necessary economic resources to show off their diplomacy at this moment, but in the future probably. And therefore, China should take it easy and don't uh, use the mindset of zero sum to gauge, to judge their moves. This is a reflection of the Chinese confidence, right? I think to a large extent, uh, Mr. Modi, President Prime Minister Modi, was uh, reacting with the West Western countries, you know, like the, you know, it was the U.S. and other countries, you know, who are uh, inviting them to do that this way. And uh, I don't think the uh, Modi himself, you know, will you know, uh, contain China uh, in his uh, in his policies, right? You know, and uh, I, I think uh, so. We should, you know. Do more, you know. Just on my many questions, you know, just like uh, APEC and so we should do more just to build up the uh, mutual trust, and this is very important because we are, especially our um, two countries, were lacking this is the mutual trust, and uh, I think this is because of some outside reasons. We should, you know, uh, we should trust each other. This is very important, and uh, if you look at the, our OBOR initiative, and uh, we are very sincere, you know, to you know. And uh, there's no need for the Indian government, for me, the Prime Minister, you know, to, to have this, you know, in his mind, you know, for of the future trust. We are very open, we are very sincere uh, with the, uh, all, all the way the country, in, including India. Do you expect the Chinese Navy to establish its solid and formidable presence in the Indian Ocean, simply for the protection of the freedom of navigation? And do you think one day, instead of uh, adopting zero-sum game, 
the Indian side uh, will tend to join the naval exercise instead of uh, excluding or rejecting China, which might be counterproductive in reinforcing our suspicion that you take this part as your backyard. And uh, that also causes a strong rebound from your neighboring countries like Sri Lanka and uh, Pakistan. Firstly, I don't think that the situation in the Indian Ocean today is such that requires a major either Chinese or other naval presence. The uh, anti-piracy operations have by and large been successful. Piracy has come down to a record low level. So I don't look at it uh, as essential. As far as uh, exercises are concerned, as I said, uh, it is something that I think both countries should look at. Um, joint exercises, China and India. Um, it is something that would be I mean, I don't like the term, but confidence building measure, it is something that could uh, be explored. Uh, uh, it, it, it's something that has no downside to it, as I can see. As far as um, the Chinese um, uh, posing a threat, I doubt if uh, that is the way I would look at it, and which is why the maritime silk route also, which uh, you made an oblique reference to. Um, I mean, I really don't see what is new about it. Their ports are already existing, the sea routes are already there, people are already traversing that uh, thing. So what exactly is the concept? I'm afraid I am not aware, personally, of the details of that. Against the background of the Doklam crisis, I read one article by uh, an Indian strategist. He says, whether we're going to have a peaceful solution to the Doklam crisis uh, uh, will decide the perception of the Indian government about China and the bilateral relationship. If you decide to uh, use force and to have a military solution, then we would switch to a more hostile uh, strategic policy. Having said this, uh, do you believe uh, whether we have the quiet waters or choppy waters instead in the Indian Ocean depends on the confidence building measures uh, like uh, seeking more diplomatic solution to the Kashmir issue or uh, border negotiations. I don't think we should uh, ignore Doklam since you raised it. It is uh, an issue that has come up. Uh, Was it a barometer? Uh, I think in a way Touched it on? indicates a change in the relationship that uh, exists. For the bad or good? Well, I would, I would not say good or bad, but I, it is a change. Um, it was not a positive development, but it showed that there were cool minds on both sides. It showed that, and that is why, again, I come to the thing about frequency of meetings. It showed that uh, it was possible to settle something that was beginning to get out of hand. Um, I personally don't think uh, that it would have been war, but one doesn't know. Uh, but I think it was well resolved. It is some, uh, we should draw lessons from it. We should understand that we should not allow a Doklam kind of thing to happen. And uh, the way out is, as I said, cooler minds and uh, continuous meetings. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you.